You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 247. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Well, hello there, veggie lovers. Welcome back to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today we have with us Kim Campbell from the Campbell family. This is a great interview and I just love her newest book. I know you will too. You definitely have to grab a copy. So let me tell you more about Kim Campbell. She is the author of The Plant Pure Nation and The Plant Pure Kitchen Cookbooks. Her newest cookbook is called Plant Pure comfort. It's been out since December of 2022. And she developed more than 350 delicious whole food plant-based recipes using no process oils. She's also the director of culinary education and development at Plant Pure, where she works with her husband, Nelson, building an organization that promotes a whole foods plant-based diet. Nelson directed and produced the groundbreaking movie, Plant Pure Nation. If you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It is definitely something that's available online. Look up Plant Pure Nation. Really great documentary. Kim graduated from Cornell University with a BS in human service studies with a concentration in nutrition and child development. Her passion has always been nutrition education for children, families, and adults. Kim has been a plant-based cook for more than 25 years, cooking for her family and friends. Her love of culinary goes back to her early childhood growing up in a large traditional family. Kim is gifted at creating traditional American cuisine using 100% accessible plant-based ingredients. She builds flavors and textures that are familiar to most people, helping to make the transition to plant-based diet easier for people. She is also the daughter-in-law of Dr. T. Colin Campbell, considered by many as the science father of the rapidly growing plant-based nutrition movement. In this episode, we talk about her plant-based journey, what it was like raising plant-based kids, how old they are now, and if they still follow a plant-based diet, how she became a chef, and was she always a good cook. We talk about her culinary philosophy and the culinary philosophy they have at Plant Pure. We talk about why she chose to write Plant Pure Comfort Food and how it's different from her other cookbooks. We also talk about the mission and vision of Plant Pure and where the organization is going to be going in a few years. We talk about the Plant Pure immersions, the newest documentary coming up, and a lot more. So this is a great episode to get to know Kim Campbell, the mission of Plant Pure, and also more about this cookbook, which I've already made several recipes. I guarantee you're going to like it. Grab a copy. It's very accessible but also yes, just delicious. I talk about a couple of the recipes I've made in there already, and I plan to make more. Thank you, veggie lovers, for being here. I hope you love this episode. Thank you for my long-time listeners for being here. Welcome to the new listeners. I hope you stay a while, you take a peek around at all the other episodes, and that you enjoy it. And now let's welcome Kim Campbell. Kimberly Campbell, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Hi, Yami. Nice to meet you. I'm so glad to be here. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you. And oh man, I should have put your book. I don't know where I put it, but I. It's okay. I, love, I have it. I love. <laughs> oh, I love your cookbook. I've already made several recipes out Good. of it, including the berry pie. Mm-hmm. It was a huge hit. At, at the office. So I am really excited to talk to you about your background and everything. So let's start there. Let's talk about your plant-based journey 
and how you even arrived at learning about plant-based eating and cooking it. So, so tell me a little bit about that. Well, let's see, I've been doing this for probably over 30 years now because I married into the Campbell family. So I don't, I don't know if I really had a choice, but my passion has always been around nutrition. <clears throat> so when I met Nelson back in high school, I met Colin, Dr. Campbell, when he was doing his research in China. So that's what inspired me. I was also very interested in nutrition, but it really inspired me to go into the dietetics program in college. Um, I was disillusioned, as you know. They, in the 80s, we were, they were not teaching nutrition the way he was. The research was pointing to plant-based nutrition. So I was disillusioned. I went into teaching, and I ended up working because I love children. I ended up becoming a, a teacher. Um, and then had three children and raised them plant-based and it was very passionate. I taught it in my neighborhood. I taught it in my schools and that's always what I wanted to do. It's what, it's, it's what really drove me. So I feel like I've gone full circle. I've left the classroom and now I'm, you know, doing all things plant pure here with Nelson. So I love what I do. Um, and it's, it's been a journey and it's been a fun journey. That's awesome. Well, what was it like raising plant-based kids, especially back in the day when things weren't quite as easy? I mean, now you can go to the store and there's like over 20 different versions of plant-based milks and all kinds of alternatives, and it makes it easier, especially for school-age kids and packing lunches. So what was it like? It wasn't easy. Um, you know, we did it, and it was, it was something that, you know, I was – that's where my brain was 150%, but it wasn't always easy to find plant-based products. Like even, you know, sometimes I dabble in the plant-based, you know, products. Um, they weren't even there when, when my kids were little. Um, so, we, you know, we were making hummus sandwiches and even soy milk wasn't that common. There weren't very many uh, vegan cookbooks. I had one or two on my hands, but I pretty much what I developed was what came from mainstream recipes. So I took my mother's old recipes and a lot of the cookbook recipes and I converted them. The kids actually did it with me. Um, and you know that I think what happened is a lot of cheating happened, right? Because I was teaching full time, taking three kids into school with me, making three lunches every morning. And that's when the kids would tease me, I want to go Gert. Or I want, you know, they wanted the things that the other kids, you know, the string cheese, which I didn't buy, but that's when we did get into some cheating and they were trading lunches with their friends. So I feel like if I had raised them in today's world, there would have been less cheating. But um, I think I still think we were pretty, we were pretty good. I mean, the kids were, I would say, pretty much 95% there um, by the time they were in middle school, for sure. Yeah. And how old are your kids now? Oh, they're adults. Um, I have my oldest is 32, and then I have a son who's 29, and I have a, my youngest daughter's 26, and they're all plant based. Um, my both my daughters were health and wellness majors. One of them is a nurse now. The other one's a therapist. So it's kind of interesting the the path that they've taken. But you know, I, I think I think we raised them plant. You know, with our philosophy about nutrition, and they were exposed to you know their grandfather and all of the education the films that I showed them so I think I educated them and kind of gave them a really good foundation for what they do now yeah and that's what I tell parents too is you know kids will be kids and it's very common for them to trade lunch items and come home in their lunchbox with wrappers of things you did not send with them. <laughs> that's <laughs> very so common. That's not, that's not abnormal at all. But I think that especially when we offer the education and the support and we do it in a loving and a compassionate way without pressure and without shaming, they absorb that. And as they grow, they're able to make their decisions in a way that reinforces how they feel and how they want to feel so they'll mm -hmm. remember you know they'll be like yeah when i eat this way i follow this pattern of eating it actually mm -hmm. feels good and they're not doing it from a place of like oh if i don't do this i'm a bad person or if i don't do this i'm going to die of a heart attack it's more like i do this because it affirms me and it makes me feel good and, and it aligns with my values you know and I feel like that happens a lot. Even if they stray for a little while, they end up coming back because that's where their roots are. So it's good to hear you know, that I, that's what happened with your children too. I think they have to stray a little bit. 
And and I and I remember my oldest in particular went to a pajama party one time and, and ate milkshakes and pizza and all the things that we don't eat at our house. When she came home, she was really hurting and very uncomfortable. She had cramps and complained. And I said, well, a lot of that's the food that you're eating. So trying to explain to her and she, you know, she very quickly, that was third grade, she very quickly you know, did a 360 on her, some of her food choices. So if it weren't, if it weren't for some of those experiences with our kids, I'm not sure they'd be where they are now. So. Exactly. And you know, that's why I talk about don't stress when they do that because it's all a learning experience and that's how we learn. That's how we learn anything really is by trial and error. So that's really good to hear. So tell me about your cooking. So were you always such a great cook or is this something that developed over time? Yeah, I, I, I have been cooking since I was probably seven or eight years old. I was the youngest wow. of four, so we had a big family. My mother was very creative. She was a good cook. She sewed, she gardened, she did all of those things. So I kind of followed those footsteps and when um, I was in college, I cooked a lot. When we got married and I started having kids, I loved the creativity of food. And I, I think it's, I love to nurture people with food. <laughs> it's just what I do. In fact, I don't even know when somebody comes to my house and they're here, I don't know how not to cook for them because I just enjoy it. Um, I like the creative process of it too, trying to figure out how to make plant-based food that is enticing for mainstream people and that's where this cookbook comes from is when we were doing our immersion in Greensboro we can talk about that later because Nelson did a a documentary that comes out this month we were trying to figure out what what are these people used to eating you know taking some of their traditional recipes and making them plant-based which is what I've always done but I decided my third cookbook was going to be called the comfort food cookbook because I think Americans they always go back to what they grew up on so these recipes are from kind of all over the world. Um, I tried to pick different cultures and recipes that were familiar and comfortable, whether it was falafels from Israel or paella from Spain or I'm trying to think, I, you know, I have sushi wrappers, things like that. Yeah. I love it. And it's so delicious, all of the food you have in there. Tell me about your culinary philosophy. We at Plant Pure, we don't use oil. You know, a lot of people who know us know we have a frozen line, so we don't use any oil. I I really just don't believe that we need even a little bit of it to make food taste good. Um, I know that a lot of people, when they're transitioning away, they have to kind of slowly move away from the oil. But I I think you can use plant-based foods that have plenty of oil in them, like an avocado or some nuts and seeds and Um, maybe a little bit of coconut milk occasionally. I think I use those instead of oil. Um, I use a little bit of salt and sugar um, to mainly make the food taste good because I think if you can't flavor it a little bit with spices and seasonings, it's not going to taste like anything. So I'm not SOS free, um, but I'm O free. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and I, I feel like your recipes are super well balanced and they play on all those different aspects of the things that we're looking for. I'm a creamy type person, so that's why the berry cheesecake was one of the first things I made from your book. It was so good. And actually, to, to be honest with you, when I was looking at the recipe, I was like, I'm not sure if this is going to be sweet enough because it actually mm-hmm. doesn't have any sugar. And I was just like, I don't know. We'll see. And it was a hit, like my um, employees have already asked me to make it again. (laughs) So I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah, it was so yummy, so delicious and so balanced. Yeah. Did you use the agar for that, Yami? Did you have agar? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's Mm -hmm. one of those weird ingredients. I try not to use a lot of weird ingredients, but every now and then you put something in there that's a little different and unusual, but it's just a seaweed, which helps things. It's like a seaweed that makes things gel. Helps things set. Yeah. Gel up and set. Okay. Well, I guess you kind of touched on this a little bit, but how is Plant Pure Comfort Food different from your other cookbooks? It's, uh, so I always tell people, it's it's the third book where I learned from the first two. <laughs> so I think it's the best one of the three. Um, Plant Pure Nation was a cookbook that we did for, when we did the film Plant Pure Nation, we did a lot of immersions. We had hired a chef. I was working with the chef. 
Um, we had hundreds of people going through these immersions and a lot of people asking me for the recipes. So I wanted to provide a resource. So I, the cook, the first cookbook just kind of happened. It was me throwing it together and just not putting a ton of thought into a theme. I just wanted recipes that we were using during jump starts. Um, I went on, I had more recipes. I did plant pure kitchen and then plant pure comfort happened. I like to think of it sort of as my pandemic cookbook because a lot of these recipes were developed during the pandemic. We decided to do a um, cook along show. So every Thursday night at 6.30, we turned our cameras on live and we cooked a meal from beginning to end. And we did that for about 50 weeks. And during that time, a lot of people were saying, oh, you need to put this in a cookbook. And it was great because they were my testers. Uh, and so they were giving me advice and feedback and I called the publishing company at the end of the year and said, hey, I, I think I have a cookbook. <laughs> and they were really excited about what we were doing. Um, so it's kind of the pandemic cookbook. <laughs> nice. It's nice to hear that you were productive during the pandemic. So you used your time well and something <laughs> fruitful came of it. So that's really cool. Well, tell me about your mission and vision with Plant Pure and where do you hope to see it be in a few years? Where do you want it to be in a few years? Right. Um, so, you know, Nelson produced or, or wrote a documentary um, a couple years ago. Well, it was, gosh, it was, yeah, about a year and a half ago. We did a, um, an immersion in Greensboro and we used diabetic patients. Um, six of them were diabetics and then two, they had two spouses that came along with them. We lived in a uh, bed and breakfast for 10 days and we hired, um, we had, we, we brought Lori Marbus on, who was a Dr. Lori Marbus, who was our physician. She worked with the diabetic patients and I won't tell you what happened because you'll have to watch the film. Uh, we made a film of it. It's called From Food to Freedom. And it's very exciting because the results were amazing. It's so hard for me not to tell you what happened in this film. Um, but my, my vision, uh, personally, I would like to start doing more immersions, more live-in immersions where people can come and be, you know, and be together for a week, 10 days and really learn this. So that's, that's by passion. I know Nelson will probably keep telling stories and documentaries because that's his passion and you'll have to do a podcast with him if you want to learn more about that. But I'm the food and the education person. So I loved um, the immersion. I pretty much cooked all the food for everybody for 10 days and we hired another chef called Fernando. Uh, his name was Fernando Peralta. And uh, we, we just had so much fun nurturing and watching these people heal. It was amazing and i've seen it happen so many times but when you're living with them and you're experiencing it together it was it was pretty amazing that's so cool and one thing that i'm always interested in is how people react because i feel like there's all these stereotypes and myths about eating this way and how it's bland and it tastes like cardboard and you're just eating a bunch of grass like a cow <laughs> so do you feel like the immersion participants were pretty shocked that the food was so delicious and filling and amazing. Yeah. In fact, that's in the film too. Um, you know, many people said to us, they had no idea the food was going to taste this good. You know, I, I was, I was putting on the best food. It, you know, it wasn't complicated food. I mean, it was things like we did a uh, lasagna and mashed potatoes and veggie loaf and we did tacos and potato bars. It wasn't complicated, but it was definitely, we put a lot of love and energy into it. And they said, one fellow in particular said, I have not eaten this much food in so long. Um, and he had amazing results. So I think the food is what really kept people on target. The, the issue was when they left the immersion, and that's in the film too. And we, 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 we revisit, revisit those people six months later. But yeah, the food was not like cardboard. It was not bland. It was not salad. It was so much more than salad. <laughs> yeah. We need to make just the whole world an immersion. Like it'll just be a complete 100% immersion. <laughs> Basically change everybody's food. <laughs> that would be good. Well, tell me about more about the immersions. And is it something, I know that y'all have done them in the past. Is it something that you're still actively doing? Or did that slow down with COVID? Um, we're not doing immersions right now. Um, we, you know, we did jump starts, you know, with Plant Pure Nation, and you can see that in the film. 
We're not doing immersions right now because we're pretty immersed in the film. Um, there's a lot that goes into getting it produced. And I've been working on, you know, cookbook, all things cookbook. Um, so our goal is to actually do some immersions here. I don't know when, I don't know when the, when the timeline will happen, but, but that's our goal. We also have a frozen food line. So I feel like we have our fingers in a lot of things. We have a frozen food line that you can um, access our food through Publix and Lowe's Foods. Um, I'm, I developed a dry line, so I have a line of products that are mostly sauces. And, you know, it's like an enchilada sauce and a curry sauce and a gravy and a, uh, I'm trying to think of peanut sauce. So you can take those sauce packets and add just water to it, or you can develop a recipe from it. So I've been working on that, which is, I probably have 50 recipes that go with our dry line. So the food part of this is never ending. <laughs> so there's always something to work on and improve and yeah. develop, right? That's really cool. Yeah. Where do you, where do you sell the dry line at? We ha it's not it's not available yet. We're hoping it will be available when the film comes out at the end of March. Um, and right now, our co-packer is packing it, um, and we're hoping it will be ready and in time ready in time for when the when film comes out. And the film um, from from Food to Freedom, we just showed it to our pod. It's it's done. It's ready. Um, it'll be available on Food Revolution Network, and you can also go to PlantPureCommunities.org. And you can go in there and sign up to receive the information about the film because it's not it's not currently you can't go on the website and find it now you'll have to have to kind of wait if you're a pod cool. leader and you would like to share the film with your pod um, you know please contact us and we, we can make that happen cool I'm technically a pod leader but um, oh. <laughs> ask me how active I've been on that recently. We just moved to a new office and yeah, immersed in my pediatric practice. So, well, so I, I love can, to can, know. Can I, can I interrupt yeah. you for a second? Because I know you're a pediatrician. Interrupt me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I love children. I love children. And I taught school for over 10 years and had three of my own. So how successful are you at getting your, your families and your patients to kind of open their minds to, to, to maybe thinking about going plant-based? Or is that something that you don't? Well, the thing is, is that my population is already leaning that direction. Mm -hmm. um, most aren't 100% plant-based, but a lot are, I would say, plant-heavy and already mm -hmm. very open, you know, because my the name of my practice is Nourish Wellness. I am lifestyle medicine based so it's a primary care practice but it has a lifestyle medicine emphasis so like all over the website everywhere you see like fruits and veggies and you see like that's what we promote here mm -hmm. so people know i'm very regularly having discussions about you know getting dairy out eating more plants eating less animal products so it's not a difficult sell around here but like mm -hmm. i said i attract that population yeah. Now, in my previous yeah. practice was a little bit different population, and it was one of those things that sounded very foreign and very difficult to my families. And I, I just really think it depends on the family's current lifestyle and mm -hmm. how busy they are. Like in my previous practice, there were parents that were working two jobs and working, you know, like literally 20 hours a day. Like mm -hmm. they, and it's really difficult to ask a family who, is basically just surviving depression, anxiety, sleep deprivation, you know, to just change things very dramatically, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so there's not the bandwidth, there's not the energy, and it's mostly just like, I just need to get my kids fed, and this yeah. is what my kids want to eat, because, you know, kids will be kids. So mm -hmm. once they get used to a certain thing, that's what they demand. And especially if they're watching a lot of television, we know what that leads to, right? So they're seeing the ads. They want the Takis, which is the hot Cheetos around here. They want that. They want the cereals. They want those things that are more hyper palatable. And that's what mm -hmm. they demand of their parents. So it can be a vicious cycle. But I'm mm -hmm. fortunate that my practice, I get to work with families that are receptive. So those conversations aren't difficult, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I'll have my teenagers and patients here and there that's a little bit more of a struggle but it when I have the conversations it doesn't 
it's not like I'm talking about something that parents have never heard of, you know, they're already right. kind of aligned. Mm-hmm. So I'm lucky that way. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah. I would love to know, and I always ask this of cookbook authors, and I know it's a very difficult question, okay? So they always say it's an unfair question. But what is your favorite recipe in this cookbook? Um, you know, it's a good question. And I, I, I have tend to have the same answer. But I'm, you know, I'm a moody eater. So, like, if I'm feeling a little, like, down or it's rainy, I want pizza. If I'm, you know, if it's winter time and I want something, you know, warm, it just depends on the season. It depends on the mood. We're all just, I think we eat with our emotions. I do anyways. Um, This cookbook, I'd say that my favorite recipe, I have two. One is the lasagna soup and the other is the sweet potato chocolate pudding pie, which yummy. If you have not made that, you have to make it. I made it already. It's really good. <laughs> okay. we, fed it to, we fed that to our immersion and people, and they kept saying, there's no sugar in this? I said, well, except for the chocolate chips, which is a very small amount. No, yeah. it's just dates and sweet potatoes, and it's pretty, pretty amazing. It's pretty decadent, too. It's very filling. Yeah. You don't need a lot. And the lasagna yes. stew is just like lasagna in a bowl. doesn't get any easier than that. I need to make the lasagna stew because I love I love lasagna soup and I made the sweet potato pie when we had my son's girlfriend over for the first time for dinner and she had never she has a dairy sensitivity slash allergy she doesn't get anaphylaxis but she doesn't have dairy and she had never or never remembered at least having chocolate and I was like how can you live your whole life and not have chocolate so anyway that blew her away so she was like this is amazing so now since she now knows that there's such a thing as like chocolate with no milk in it it's revolutionized her life but she loved the pie Mm -hmm. (laughs) it was great it was a good recipe for that yeah awesome okay which recipe was the most like head banging complex you had to tweak a lot of times and like you almost had to give up on (laughs) testing Uh, um, it, it probably was the Spanish paella. Hmm. Um, paella, my daughter went to Spain and she was there for a few months and she said, mom, you have to make paella. And I said, but isn't that the, the recipe where they put all the clams and the seafood all over the top? And she said, oh yes. And I can't say that my kids don't cheat. So she got it with the seafood and, but she said, but I think you can make it plant-based. Um, but it has, you know, they use oil in it and it, it, it's, they have a crust on the bottom of the pan. They have a way of doing it. So um, I contacted one of my uh, doctor friends um, in Spain. She's plant-based. And I said, I got to make Spanish paella. What can you do? So she shared with me how they did it. And then I just kind of went back and forth. I, I made it several times because do you use white white rice? Or do you use whole brown rice? Do you do it in the instant pot? Do you use saffron, which is kind of a, a snobby spice because a lot of people can't afford it. So I would say that's the one I, I spent a lot of time on and that sweet potato pie, but that didn't take me very long to know that it was good from the first time out of the gate. Yeah, but awesome. I, you know, I've, I've done it for so long, Yami, that I feel like in my head, Nelson always says, how do you know that? And I said, I don't know. I just feel like I know that I know the substitutions. And I feel like if Mm -hmm. if I can take a traditional recipe and I can use, you know, a plant based yogurt that I've made or I can use um, uh, soy curls or lentils or something to substitute the meat and the dairy, I kind of have an idea of how it's going to work. So I, I can't say that I spent four or five tests on a recipe. That doesn't happen here. We do it maybe twice and it's good. On to the next one. (laughs) Nice. You're a very intuitive cook then, a very intuitive chef. That's great. Because I think that's the hardest part about recipe development is the back and forth. That's where I get lazy because I'm not super picky. I love food. So to me, it's always just good enough. I'm like, oh, this this is delicious. (laughs) But I know that I always feel bad because I feel like people expect that if you put a recipe on social media or something, it's like, this perfection, but I, I don't go I don't to that think level. So. I, I don't think so. I think a lot of people just do it once or twice. And I think the key to developing a recipe is writing it all down. So you probably mm. come up with something that you love. And then if you're like a lot of people, you can't remember what you put in it. So you just, <laughs> I keep my computer or pad or something all the time. I write everything down and I, I learned that the hard way. 
Yeah. I think that's, so you, that's you learn to be before. organized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, my exactly. dad's the same way when he cooks. He never remembers anything, and we just he'll make something and we love it. And we're like, do it again. And he does it again. We're like, no, it's not the same. <laughs> Something's different. <laughs> yeah. 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 What do you wish more people knew? Uh, what do I wish more? I, I wish more people knew that eating plant-based is not just eating salad and roasted, ve- roasted vegetables. I, I, I really wish when I, when I tell people I'm plant-based or vegan and I don't, I don't really tell them that and, and unless they really ask and dive into our lifestyle, but I think they just have this idea of what we eat. And I went to a wedding recently and there, there was no plant-based food there. And I got some salad and I think I got some oily vegetables and a piece of white bread because there wasn't really much to eat and kind of pushed it around. And the person that was sitting next to me said, is that all you're going to eat? And I said, well, you know, probably. And, and it was, it was a little embarrassing, but you know, she, as we got talking, she realized I didn't eat meat and I didn't eat dairy um, and, and why I did what I did. But, but I think people have this idea that, that that's how I eat and that's how my plate looks. And our daughter got married last May and we did a fully plant-based wedding and you would not believe how our plates look. They were just like loaded with all kinds of curries and different things. So yeah, I wish more people knew that. I wish they knew how good this diet was. I agree with you. And I even think about whenever I get to go to the conferences, like the plant-based conferences in my favorite part. I love the lectures. Obviously, I'm a nerd, so I love the lectures, but I really love the buffet. And <laughs> you get, you load your plate. And it's just so many wonderful recipes, and it's so delicious, and you're beyond satisfied. I mean, there's all the flavors and the colors and the aromas. It's just so amazing. And mm-hmm. I agree with you. I think that even professional chefs, a lot of them, have no clue. Like you'll go to this restaurant and the options are just like, it's all plain vegetables. They're not using beans. They're not using whole grains. You know, it's like basically I'm just going to grill this broccoli for you. And that's your, Mm -hmm. that's what you eat. And like, no, I eat more than just that, even though I love it. Broccoli is my favorite. And there's, there's so many plants. So I'm still learning. I mean, there's still things that come up, you know, what was it, five years ago, jackfruit became a big thing. And I thought, mm-hmm. oh, what is this jackfruit? And then it was soy curls. And now there's all, I mean, when I was a kid, you're younger than I am. But when I was growing up, we didn't have fresh mushrooms in the grocery store, let alone a variety of mushrooms. So now we have all different kinds of mushrooms, king mushroom, king oyster mushrooms and shiitake and on and on it goes. But I think that the world of plants is much more diverse than going to the the meat counter. There's not a lot on the meat counter. <laughs> so I, 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 I people just understood how many different kinds of grains we eat. In fact, we, we did this exercise the other day and Nelson said, I, I wonder how many, how many different vegetables we ate today. So we started counting up. Oh my goodness, we, we, we were in the 30s. Because I said, well, don't forget, the dressing had this, this, and that. And the salad had this. And the loaf had this. So we started adding it up. But the diversity of our diet is huge, which creates a much healthier gut biome. Um, so I, 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 just, I just don't think we even really know. We know the benefits, but do we really know all the benefits of eating a plant-based diet. You know, I get religious about this because I just think there's there's so many benefits and so many different things that we can do with our diet. Um, you know, diabetes, heart disease, you know, menopause, women's health, children's health, just on and on. Don't get me going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of just a nerd well-being when it comes to the too. lectures. Yeah, and just so what, well-being. So even if you don't have a chronic condition, but you're, you know, you're – not feeling good you're not having good energy eating more plants eating more fiber eating less processed foods it can make a huge difference just like hopefully we're going to see soon in this film in a matter of days it doesn't have to take months and years it can be days so i think it's worth trying and considering for people that would like to feel different Mm-hmm. What what could it be for you if you decided to adopt a whole food plant based diet? So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Do you have a morning routine? Do I have a morning routine? I'm kind of an early morning person. Um, sleep is 
and we eat really well and I exercise, but sleep is, I find the older I get, um, it's, it's not always a given that you're going to get a full eight hours of sleep. So I get up pretty early in the morning and, um, I'm trying to think what my routine is. We, we walk together. I walk two or three miles a day. And the, probably one of the first few things I do in the morning is drink a lot of water that keeps the plumbing going. Um, <laughs> and then we pretty much work, um, and just just stay active. I don't have a specific morning routine as far as what I eat. It depends on my mood. Uh, we eat oats in the morning, or I might have peanut butter toast now and then, or maybe plant-based yogurt. Um, so I've kind of gotten into this really bad, it's not a bad habit, um, but this habit of having ice cream for breakfast. Uh, so, nice. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just I bought this, um, the Ninja Creamy. Do you know about the Ninja Creamy? Yeah, um, yeah I heard I it's awesome. Thing. Do you love it? <laughs> I love it. So what I do with the night before is I put like all sorts of things in it, like bananas and berries and yogurt, and I kind of decide what I'm going to have my ice cream and then I freeze it and then the next morning I make ice cream because I love ice cream and I, I just don't feel guilty about it because I, I put a lot of you can put oats in it you can put soy milk in it so that's kind of my routine I, I, I guess I'm not I don't have a specific routine or a specific breakfast I wish I could tell you that but I'm I'm probably not that routine yeah, about how everybody's I do different I I'm just always curious so yeah it's great to hear and it, yeah. it sounds like your ice cream is a very health promoting ice cream. So it's not like it's, you're sitting there <laughs> eating Ben and Jerry's no. or Hagen dazs <laughs> so, no. Think of like a, a frozen it. smoothie is, is what I think of. But I, I yeah. grew up, my, my father was a dairy farmer, so we always had ice cream in the house. Yeah. And then we went plant-based yeah. and that was the hardest thing for me to give up. So now with this Ninja Creamy, I just, I love it. <laughs> Get to have it every breakfast. I love it. Start your day with ice cream. Start your day right. Yes. Well, this has been great, Kim. Can you tell us where listeners can connect with you and where they can find your book? Okay. Um, <clears throat> you can get the Plant Pure Comfort book, and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, you can get this on Amazon. Um, it's avail it was been available since December. You can find more recipes because I'm always developing and creating things and giving people tips and ideas. You can go to Plant Pure Chef Instagram or you can go to Plant Pure Nation Instagram. I do both of them. Somehow I inherited one from my daughter who was managing one. Um, we have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. If you are interested in becoming a pod leader or finding out if there's a pod near you, we, our nonprofit organization is called Plant Pure Communities. Dot org. You can go in there. You can find out if there's a pod locally, if you wanted to become a pod leader. And I can't say enough. I know we're all busy and I got really busy and I kind of let my pod go and combined with the Chapel Hill pod. So we have pod meetings every month, but it's so nice. Uh, we've really gotten to know people. We don't have huge meetings. I mean, sometimes it's just 30 people. We had 80 people show that we showed the film last weekend, but Sometimes just starting small and having five or six or seven people come together that are like-minded and can just share and talk about the things that you and I talked about. So that's plantpurecommunities.org. If you want to know what we're doing at Plant Pure Nation, you can go, plant, go to plantpurenation.com, um, and that gives you information about our food. But for the film, you would go to plantpurecommunities.org. Phew, <laughs> that was a mouthful. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. No, that's good. Okay, that's great. And... Final question, what advice do you give to parents regarding preparation and traditions around food? Um, involve your children, your kids. I don't care how old they are. If they're two, get them up to the sink and get them doing things, even if it's little things. Um, and then if they're, in, if they're high school or they're middle school, get them involved in cooking and planning. Um, but because I can't stress enough the fact that I think we go out to eat too much. I think kids rely on convenience and fast foods. And to get them to walk away from that, you can't cut it off right away because that's, that's difficult. But if you can get them involved and say, hey, you know, can you make Tuesday night's meal? And maybe it's pizza, making it plant-based and just involving them. And then lastly, I sound like I'm preaching here, <laughs> but... Getting everybody to sit down together at a meal, even if it's just 
oh my gosh, if it's cereal and you don't want to cook, you know, sit down together, talk about the day and, you know, be a family because I, when my experience in teaching was that a lot of kids are not doing this and I get it, you're busy. Um, but you know, at least try to do it a few times a week. Um, and, and really focus on that because the kids need you and you, they're watching you. <laughs> good, yes. bit, good, bad, and ugly, right? They watch everything we do. So Yes, absolutely. And yeah, the data shows it doesn't have to be every day. And I know that people have different schedules and different work schedules and sports and things like that. But even if you can do it three to four times a week, it doesn't have to be dinner. One of our big celebrations every week is we have what I call Sunday special breakfast. So I'll sleep in on Sunday morning because that's my one day I sleep in and get up and I very calmly make an amazing brunch for us. And so a lot of times it'll be like a scramble and I'll do some veggies and sometimes maybe some waffles or some pancakes. Anyway, it's amazing. And we all look forward to that. And that's one of the times that we have meals together. Friday night, we have meals together. And then during the week, we try to wherever we can. But as my kids have gotten older, they're off at sports, they're off at their activities, you know, things change over time. So especially you parents of younger kids, take advantage while they're younger to sit down mm -hmm. at the table with them because it changes fast as they get older and get involved it in their activities. Does. It really does. Well, Kim, thank you so much for everything that you do. You are just working so hard and I can tell that you're so passionate and you just have so much energy to give back to the world. So I really appreciate all that you do. Thank you so much for being a guest on Veggie Doctor Radio. Good luck with your cookbook and the film and everything that's to come with Plant Pure Communities. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. And right back at you. Thank you for all that you do, Yami. We need more physicians like you in this world. Thank you. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you.